All right, well, 16.2 is line integrals. And you know this section is really where all of the kind of confusing, um, shoot, where to go? Where all the confusing like formulas come in, like what's the difference between the scalar line integral and the vector line integral, and then you have like the surface integral equivalents of it, and it just gets like a lot to kind of sort through. In terms of like on a test, you only have 50 minutes. How do you know which you know formula to use so you're not wasting time? Um, but before we start on that, I'm just going to touch really, really briefly on parameterization because that is the first step for pretty much all of the problems that we're going to be doing, dealing with line and surface integrals. So for, for parameterization, I think that maybe he did like a pretty good job um, setting out the three types of parameterization that we're responsible for. Um, you know, the, like, the easiest one is just saying like, let x be my parameter, or let y be my parameter. Let something that they already gave me, um, you know, be the parameter, so I can express like a, maybe a third variable in terms of two other variables, stuff like that. And so this second, this number two bullet should be like nothing new. <coughs> and then for the first bullet, use polar coordinates, like x equals cosine x equals r cosine of theta, y equals r sine of theta. That's like it's. It's pretty much the exact same thing that we were doing in 15.4 uh, 15 when we were just changing our variables. And so like, <coughs> actually doing that, that shouldn't be hard to um, kind of think about. Um, and then the third parameterization that he, or like formula I guess that he gave us, is actually extremely useful if you want to integrate between two points. Um, I don't know how well you guys can see this, but this formulation is, um, R of t, which is just some kind of path, equals 1 minus t times the initial point plus t times the final point. And the reason why this uh, parameterization is so useful is because it makes your parametric bounds or your links of integration 0 to 1. And if you think about that in terms of the equation, it makes sense because when t equals 0, you have 1 minus 0 plus um, 0 effectively. So you have 1 times your starting point. So when t equals 0, when you haven't moved anywhere, you start at the point that you, your initial starting point. And then when t equals 1, you have 1 minus 1, which is 0, and then plus 1 times your end point. So you're going from your starting point to your end point, and the bounds for that, or the limits of integration for that, are really simple. It's just 0 to 1. Uh, so that's really helpful. Um, looking at the objectives for 16.2, parameterize a given space curve. I just talked about that. Computing scalar line integrals, I'll get to that in a second. Um, estimate the value of vector line integrals based on a graphical portrayal of the vector field and its directed curve. Um, I'm going to go back to that like at the very end, um, after I cover 16.4 and 16.5, because I'm actually a little fuzzy on that uh, like specific point. But we can talk through that um, after. And then the second one is to compute the vector line integral. So what you effectively have in 16.2 are two different kinds of line integrals that we're responsible for. Um, so looking at the first one, looking at the scalar line integral formulation, the formula is kind of like, you know, it looks really similar to all the other formulas, so it gets kind of confusing. But if you think about what you're actually doing when you are computing the line integral, the formula, the formula makes like perfect sense. And you're not really memorizing it anymore because you're just doing what you like conceptually know to be true for these types of problems. <coughs> so over here to the right here to the uh, top left, this is just like some space curve. And if you think about what a line integral is, it's just instead of saying we're integrating from here to here on like an xy plane and I want like the area under the curve or like the area between two surfaces, now we're saying like we don't even need axes anymore. We can just go from this point in space to this point in space along the space curve. You know, it doesn't matter how like curvy that is, we can still compute that use, using line integrals. So, you know, with everything integral related, we're breaking it up into little pieces and we're just adding all those little pieces up. So, you know, kind of zooming in to this tiny chunk of the line, what you have is your DS, your differential arc length. If 
Um, it's easier to think about it that way. It, you know, it helps me think about it, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, in our lecture notes, there are there's a derivation for how ds equals the um, magnitude of c prime of t dt. So I'm not going to go into that. But conceptually, what you have to just kind of you know accept is this part of the uh, formulation, this magnitude of d of c prime of t dt, is just each one of these little tiny arc lengths of this line that, we're, that we want to integrate over. Um, so the second part of a line integral is, you know, if we were if we left it just at that, all we're really doing is finding the arc length. And you know, if I covered up this f of c prime of, or f of c of t, that is the arc length um, integration formula, where you're adding up little itty bitty like this. What's up? Or if it's one. Oh yeah, or if it's one. Um, but like for line integrals, we want to investigate a function along a line, along a curve, or a certain path. So this is where the other half of the formula comes from, where you have f of c of t. What you're effectively doing is you're plugging in the curve into whatever function we gave you, because you only want to look at that function um, as it applies on that curve. You don't care about the function where it's over here if your path is like you know at the back of the room. Um, so does that does that make sense in terms of like what that formula actually means? Did you hear about the current example? I did not hear about the current example. What do you want to share? So it's like you have you have you're going along a line. Okay. Say like that's where the curve is, and then each like the height at that point represents the current's height. So uh -huh. you're just adding up all the values of that. So that represents like the total height, of, like like the height of a curve at a certain point that you add. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so what Abhishek was saying was like, in his example, that third variable or that function was just a function to model the height of the curtain. Right. And the whole integral represents the area. Yeah. Okay. Um, so C of T is the line. Yeah, the line, the path. And, you know, they're not usually going to give us like, just evaluate it along this curve, C of T equals something from here to here, because that's too simple. That's why we went over like how do you actually parameterize it? Um, if they just say like compute it along the intersection of this like hyperbola and this like part of the sphere or something. Um, but we, we can practice more of those parameterizations when we go over the practice test. <clears throat> so that's the that's the scalar scalar line integral. And when you think about the formulas. None of these are vectors. Like none of these have a you know direction associated with it. I see a vector. That's a vector. Well, right, well the space curve has vectors. Okay. <laughs> They're just being difficult. Yeah. Okay. Um, but does that make sense? How like everything we're doing here? I didn't say anything about a specific direction. About saying positive is going clockwise or counterclockwise. Nothing about that. And you know the questions that they would ask, like it will become immediately evident that you're doing a scalar line integral because there aren't going to be any vectors there. Um, it's literally just going to be here's a function in terms of x, y, and z. Here's some other surfaces in terms of x, y, and z. Calculate the line integral along a curve, like the intersection or something. That's where the parameterization piece comes in. And now you have this um, curve c of t that you want to look at your function with. And that you want to get, like, that you want to break up into little arc points to add up. But you want to, like, have your path as, like, a vector because then when you take the derivative and you get c prime of t, you want to have that as a vector. So it's, like, also a vector notation. So because you have to take the magnitude of that vector and you put it into the integral. You're talking about c? Yeah, c. You want to have c, the path, as a vector, parameterized by t. So yeah. that you can take the derivative and take the magnitude. So you do have that. Yeah, but the magnitude itself is not a vector. Yeah, so but the magnitude is just some scalar. You said there should be no vector. When you integrate. Yeah, when, when you integrate it. Yeah. Like when they give it to you, like they're usually not going to give you that parameterized curve. Yeah. Right. So does that make sense in terms of like there aren't vectors here? Cool. All right. So the next piece is a line integral in its vector form, and if you think about you know the function, a scalar function in terms of x, y, and z. Um, <coughs> that is like the, the, that's just like the three variable functions that we've been working with all semester. 
Um, but now for a vector line integral, what you effectively have is instead of just some you know, regular function that means something, we now have a vector field. We now have all of these vectors you know, scattered around, but we only care about the vectors that are touching the curve that we want to, or the line that we want to take our integral. So if we think about, you know, going again to kind of like dissecting the um, the formula of um, a vector line integral, um, this <coughs> vector field of c of t, your curve, um, it's it means the same thing that we were doing during scalar line integrals, where we only want to look at the vector field um, that is touching or that applies to this curve that we're interested in. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> so then the second part, this um, C prime of dt, um, oh wait, not C prime of dt. C prime of t. Yeah, C, C prime of t, sorry. Um, so if you think about the vector uh, notation and like why do you take the dot product when you do this integral, if you zoom into that vector, um, or like that vector in the vector field that's touching the line, you only want to get the tangential component of that vector field along the line that you're integrating. So a, kind of like a uh, physics um, example of that, and you know, also a question that we can be asked, is calculate the work done by this vector field along this path. And you know, it makes sense that we only care about the tangential components or the components that are, um, yeah, the tangential components. Because if you think about like a perpendicular component, that's not doing anything. Like when we add that up, that that place where the uh, vector field is uh, perpendicular is just going to be zero, because the tangential component will be zero. The, okay. Hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, so like that's why we have. You know, f of c of t, just looking at the curve and the points um, or the vectors that touch that curve, and then you're dotting it with um, c prime of t dt, and that's just that step is signifying you only looking at the tangential components, and then you're integrating it from a to b, um, and that's just adding up all of those little contributions, all of those tangential contributions that the vector field is doing um, to your line. So um, I I kind of just include this in my notes because it's um, I don't think it's like too important, but uh, I just kind of did that for to have my grounds covered. But one thing to, to notice is that now that we're doing vector line integrals, direction does matter because vectors have direction and magnitude. So this first um, like vector line integral property. Um, that one is important to note because if you're going in the opposite direction of the curve specified, the way to go the other direction is to just toss a minus sign in front of it. So that gets really helpful if you think about like examples we've done in class where you want to go clockwise around the circle or something, but your parameterization makes it go counterclockwise, and then you don't know if you should change the cosine to a sine or the sine to a cosine or something. Like the easiest way out of that is to just say. I'm going around my curve, like the opposite direction specified. I want to go, you know, the other direction to like get full credit. Just throw a minus sign in front of your integral. Um, okay. So for <coughs> I'll come back to this, um, the flux or the flow across a line or across a surface. Um, I want to talk about surface integrals first. But um, so going back to the objectives, 16.2, we understand line integrals um, in its scalar and its vector form, so we should be good. Um, are all, is everyone here like good with what we've done so far in terms of saying scalar, there's like no direction involved with it, vector fields and like vector line integrals, we are, it does have a direction and we only want to pick tangential components. So if the question has a vector, does you use the vector equation? Yeah, like if you see a vector field, yeah. then and, and they want you to compute the integral about a line, then that's like the vector, yeah. Yeah, so like it becomes like really obvious when you're you know, actually doing the test and you look like immediately know that's the formulation I need. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, I'm going to reset this real quick. <laughs> 